Hello, True Crimeers. This is the case of Tina Kramer and Robert Miller. Viewer discretion is advised. Christina Frances Kramer, who would go by Tina to everyone in her life, she was born on December 16th, 1972 in Lawton, Oklahoma. She was one of four total siblings. She had two brothers and a sister. At the time this case was occurring, Tina was attending the uh, School of Nursing there in Oklahoma. In 1993, Tina would marry a man named David Kemp. But after a, just a brief amount of time, basically, Tina began to feel like this marriage was unfulfilling for her. And not only that, but also David was verbally very abusive towards her, and occasionally he was physically abusive towards her. And her friends, her family, you know, were trying to get her to leave this entire situation. The marriage wasn't, it wasn't going to last. So Tina told uh, David, I'm filing for a divorce. He wasn't super happy with that. Uh, but then one day he received divorce papers. Sort of in that in-between when she kind of told him, you know, we need to separate to when the, the divorce papers were filed. Uh, they weren't living together and David would stalk Tina. He would follow her around places. He would stalk her at her job, at school. Tina was trying to just move away from David and move on with her life. She wanted to put this abusive man in her past and move forward possibly with another man. And she did in fact meet another man. Tina was working at a hospital at this time and she, while working there, met a coworker of hers named Robert Miller, uh, who was 26 years old. The two of them hit it off really quickly. They got along so perfectly. This was the complete and polar opposite of David for her. This was a man, Robert Miller, who was incredibly loving and caring, very supportive of Tina. Robert's family loved Tina, thought she was the perfect person for Robert, and kind of the same thing for Tina's family. They're like, all right, Robert is really a stand-up guy. He is He's a good one. He's one of the good ones. And this was a relationship that probably had a lot of potential to blossom very quickly, and it may have led to marriage. Well, David Kemp had obviously found out about this relationship and just during his stalking periods. And a couple times they would go out to their cars, specifically Tina would go to her car, and on the windshield was a note that basically would say things like, if I can't have you, no one can. These notes just kind of kept appearing, and she knew who they were from. I mean, everybody knew who they were from. So David Kemp was officially given the divorce papers on August 5th, 1998. And he, like I said, was not happy with it. He was livid. He did not like this. He did not like the fact that Tina was seeing somebody else. He wanted her all for his own. Just five days later, on August 10th, 1998, Tina and Robert had a wonderful night out. They went to dinner and then they came back to Robert's apartment. What they did not know was that the entire time, David Kemp was watching them. He was stalking them. He followed them back to Robert's apartment. It's believed that Robert did not lock his apartment door when they went inside, and that may have proven to be kind of the fatal blow here. But honestly, I think David would have found a way in anyway. But. David essentially just walked into the apartment and because there was no forced entry, so either he just walked in or he was let in. Robert was shot a couple of times. Tina, at that point, was in the shower. They don't know exactly the scenario that played out from this point, but David would enter the bathroom where she was showering and he pointed the gun at Tina and fired a couple rounds into her. It would be the following day when both of their bodies were found and both were pronounced dead at the scene. Both were shot and killed. They were killed instantly. Through the police's investigation, they found out that Tina felt that she was possibly being stalked by David because of these notes that were being left behind about, if I can't have you, nobody can. Interviewing Tina's family, they found out how David was very abusive physically and emotionally, verbally, and they discovered that 
he had soon before the murders happened he literally threatened to kill Tina or end his own life. So obviously David Kemp was the first and pretty much only suspect in this case. And that's because David at that point was now on the run. Nobody knew where he was. He had left town. So they believe that the gun that was used to kill both Tina and Robert was a 44 caliber handgun. Early on in this investigation, detectives discovered that, or a man would come forward, I should say, to say that he had sold a gun to David Kemp, and it was a 44 caliber. Lucky for police, um, this man had kept several uh, fired rounds and casings and whatnot from this gun before he sold it to David. So police took those bullets and casings and whatnot, and they compared it to the bullets found in Tina and Robert, and you know they did the whole microscopic look and the striations and all that, all lined up, and they know that the gun that was sold to David was the gun used to kill both of these people. So they knew for a fact at that point, David was their killer. So this case occurred in, in Lawton, Oklahoma, but about two weeks later, all the way in California, specifically in the town of Bishop, California, a California highway patrolman saw a man walking through town and this patrolman just talked to this guy. The guy said that he ran out of gas um, in his car. He was having car issues. And so he just abandoned the vehicle on the side of the road. The patrolman found the vehicle and ran the plates. They found out that these plates belonged to a man named David Kemp. So this caused David, who was still, who was armed, um, to basically, he found out about that and he tried to run. And the patrolman called in for backup. And then there was a bunch of officers that came in because when they ran the plates, it flagged that this was a car belonging to a murder suspect, a person with a an arrest warrant. And so the, I guess like they cornered him in some kind of auto yard, uh, David, and there was about a two hour standoff between David and these cops. David at numerous times began to point the gun in his own direction and say, I'm gonna pull the trigger. But then I guess at one point he told them, can you bring me a phone so I can call my mom as some sort of like negotiating? So they would essentially tie a cell phone to a rope or a string and they dropped it into where David was just so they could be safe and not shot. And he called uh, his mom and as he's doing that, police officers found an opportunity to shoot him um, with those like uh, uh, beanbag uh, things. <laughs> And it knocked him out and he was arrested then and there. There was a pistol found in his possession and they confirmed that this was the pistol that was used to shoot Robert and Tina. So he is extradited all the way back to Oklahoma to stand trial for the murders he committed. On March 11th, 1999, about six months after his arrest, he, along with several prisoners, um, one of them, I guess, had one of those barbecue forks somehow, I don't know how they got it, and stuck it to a guard's neck um, and which helped them escape. So like eight or nine of these people escaped the, the jail. Within a short period of time, all but one of those escapees were caught. The only one who was still not found was David Kemp. Around June of 1999, now in Las Vegas, Nevada, there was a, a motel owner that had not received payment from one of his newer tenants. And so this, the motel owner goes into this room and finds the guy who's in this room in the bathtub. And this guy had a knife lying on top of him and he was covered in blood. And it appeared that this man had tried to end his own life. So the man who was under an alias was uh, taken to a psychiatric hospital and he was checked in as a John Doe. He was treated for his injuries. He was treated for his mental state and they released him. It wouldn't be until a few days later that they found out about this David Kemp person. They go, oh my God, that was the guy. They would find out from witnesses in Las Vegas that just like a day or so after he checked out of the hospital voluntarily, he was seen at a gas station getting into a vehicle. Possibly, more than likely, he hitchhiked. And then he was never seen again. No more observations were made. Eventually, this story would air on both Unsolved Mysteries and America's Most Wanted uh, because there is a wanted fugitive out there. This guy has escaped our clutches numerous times now. He is a double murderer and he is capable of murder. He could do it again. So that aired in 2002, but it didn't really help. And no one really, they didn't really get many uh, solid tips 
that were credible. Then on April 26, 2013, David Kemp just casually walks into a uh, police station there in Oklahoma and says, I'm David Kemp. You've been looking for me for years. I'm the guy who killed Tina Kramer and Robert Miller. I'm here to turn myself in. <laughs> he told them that it was that him being on the run was affecting his mental health. You poor guy. Not the murdering of two people affecting his mental health. The fact that he was on the run and always looking over his shoulder, well, that was just so much stress for him. Well, maybe if he didn't murder two people, you wouldn't have had that stress. David Kemp would not go to trial because he would end up pleading guilty to both murders. He pled guilty to other charges like escaping the jail, and he was sentenced to life in prison without parole. And that is where he is now. He is sitting in a prison cell in Oklahoma. He will never breathe free air again, and he will never see the light of day again in terms of outside of a jail or a prison. So it took about 13 or 14 years, but Tina Kramer and Robert Miller finally got the justice they both rightfully deserved. But that is it for this case, True Crime, Maroonie, Dooney, Dingleberry Dongs. I know it was kind of a shorter one. It's the luck of the draw. Uh, but anyway, if you are new here, hello, my name is Mike. Um, my name is Mike. I was about to say it again. Well, there it is again. I'm Mike. Hi, how are you? What's your name? I can't hear you. Anyway, uh, if you're new here, I tell true crime stories here on this page, obviously. So please subscribe. Um, I'm trying to get to 100,000 subscribers because I selfishly want that little plaque. So, yeah. <laughs> Um, but give the video a like so more people can see it. And then also I tell shorter form true crime stories over on TikTok. You can find the TikTok page in the link tree in the description of the video below. Also in that link tree, you will find the my case list. So the cases that I cover are on this big old long alphabetical list. It has like 6,500 names plus names on it. I pick the cases I choose at random. Um, but you can see the list, you can scroll through it, and you can check to see if a name is on there that you want to see covered. If you don't see a case on that list, then you can send me an email. My email is in the description below. My email is also listed on that document where the list is. Send me just the name of the case, individual, you know, who it happened to, or the killer, um, where it happened, and when it happened, and I'll add that name to my list. But like I said, I choose them at random, so I can't promise you when I'll cover that case, but I will get to it eventually. But at any rate, that is it for this case, True Crime Rooney. So until the next case, ta-ta for now. The dog says, the dog says good, goodbye as well. Yeah. Mm-hmm.